welcome all to this webinar. So I see there are uh, more people coming in, but this is to welcome you all to our uh, third edition of, of a Libre webinar. This time um, it's about the data citation roadmap for scholarly data repositories. And um, to inform you a little bit about the background of this, uh, this webinar, we conduct the webinar in the context of the um, Libre's working group of scientific information infrastructures, which is part of the steering committee, scholarly communication and research infrastructures. And we very much appreciate the support by the Libre office in conducting these webinars. So today we have uh, two speakers and the overall duration of the webinar will be about uh, 45 minutes. And as you may have noticed, the webinar will be recorded and later on we will make this available through YouTube. And uh, so let's start. Our speakers are uh, Mesic Rosas. Um, she works at Harvard, and uh, many of you will know her. She's leading the Dataverse project in several years and has a lot of experience in setting up uh, data management and analysis systems. And uh, our second speaker is Martin Fenner, technical director at DataSite. Um, uh, he has been involved in the Tor project and, um, and has been working for, for PLOS um, leading the article level metrics project. And yeah, the two of them will, will present. And uh, during the webinar, please uh, put your questions uh, in the chat. And after, after the presentation, we will come back to these questions. And um, yeah, the speakers will, will then respond to your questions. And uh, yeah, we will sum up the answers as well in a, in a blog post. So, Martin Mercer, you are invited to start now. <laughs> so, uh, hello, Martin. thank you, Virgit. This is Marce Crosas from Harvard University, uh, and we will, we will start. Is Martin join, joining now too? Martin. Uh, well, I will I will start the. Presentation and then I uh, I will switch to Martin after some time. <laughs> oh, Martin, sorry. Come yeah, on. I'm here, but I'm waiting for for sort of my the cue that I should start the second half. Perfect. So we're both ready uh, to give you this presentation. So let's get started. Uh, uh, we. We're going to talk about uh, uh, well, what we call a data citation roadmap for a scholarly data repositories. Uh, this is uh, now a preprint uh, that we've written with some other collaborators. Um, but we will start with how did did that uh, this whole uh, initiative got it, uh, got um, started? And it was in 2014. Some uh, of you might know about the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles. It was suggested in, a, in one of the Force 11 um, meetings, um, and, a, and uh, which I think it was in Amsterdam. And then after that, it got into a more formal um, shape by uh, some of us meeting on a regular basis for, uh, for a few months to define what would those principles be. And the principles include the importance of data citation. We all agreed that data, data uh, have to be uh, handled or treated as other research outputs similar to publications, uh, and, and they should have given it the importance and the credit that they deserve uh, because they uh, are a big part of our, what we use uh, for evidence and for um, and the, and the scholarly work that we produce as researchers. There is, there is also a principle on credit and attribution because if you're going to put uh, so uh, so much effort into creating, well, collecting a data, preparing it for, for use for others, you should get the proper credit uh, that goes with that. Uh, the evidence, as I mentioned, the data is part of the evidence of the body of work that you do, the, the discoveries that you do in, uh, in research, and, and it should count as such. Uh, unique identification is important. We'll talk about persistent identifiers and the role they play. Uh, then the access, how do, how do you, we provide access to the, to the data through the uh, data citation? 
is also important. The persistence of the data or a list of the metadata that is associated with the data, the specificity and verif uh, verifiability. We'll also discuss that in terms of uh, different versions and granularity of how do you um, you can cite or reference a data set. And the importance also of interoperability and flexibility because every community will will have different practices and even though we want them to follow those principles, they might accommodate it to their uh, to what they need. So then uh, we moved into in 2015 to take those principles and and ask ourselves what is that we we need to do what are the, uh, the minimal things that are, will be required so that this data citation can be ac accessible by humans but also by machines. Uh, and in, uh, in this paper, we discuss the importance of metadata, um, machine-readable, human-readable metadata, and the importance of persistent identifiers. And then we took that one step further, creating this um, data citation in implementation pilot or the CIP that, uh, that it was uh, coordinated by Force 11 but it is funded by BioCADI, NIH BioCADI, um, and led mostly by uh, Tim Clark, Marion Marton, and Jeff Greff of uh, Force 11 and, and BioCADI. And that, from that uh, data cit citation implementation pilot, uh, well, the, many of the the different publishers and the data and data repositories uh, join the effort and and endorse it and are a part of the of the initiative. And what so we uh, we then as part of that uh, what the principles say and and to take that into uh, the implementation state. We, we define a generic example of what a data citation would be and how we will look, uh, I mean, here the, the example that you see in this slide is how we will look in a reference list. It doesn't mean that data citation is only that because there is a, uh, the, the way you, you could get the metadata for the data citation could be in different formats, but this is uh, the example that we were giving uh, as how you would see generally in a reference list. And it includes first the authors of the, so those would be the data authors, the data generators. Uh, it includes a publication date. It includes the title of the data set. And, and then the data repository or the archive that is hosting that data, that, that has a hold of the, has the holdings um, and the records associated with that data. And that's important, that's the di a difference within publications and data set. In this case, you need a rep the repository is going to be, uh, in some sense, the publisher of that data set. And, and then a persistent identifier, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, and a, a version that goes, that could be, um, uh, example, well, it could be represented in different ways. It could be just a version number, or it could be a timestamp, or other type of uh, ways to indicate the what what part of the data set and and on what time the data set was that you're referencing was created uh, as part of the citation so that you can go and reference uh, the actual version that you use for your study or for your claims uh, then uh, as part of the data citation implementation um, pilot, we had two main groups. Uh, one was the uh, roadmap, well, they work on the roadmap for scientific publishers, and that group um, had mostly editors from different uh, um, publishers, um, uh, well, initiatives and from different uh, journals. Um, and they they also, well, they, they work as uh, the, similarly to uh, some of these other working groups or expert groups that they met on a regular basis through phone calls, um, and they put together then a roadmap in the form of a preprint that has been published in BioArchive. 
uh, in this, uh, for the group leaders for the roadmap of, of scientific publishers are Helena Kusin and Amy Ekenau. The, the publisher's uh, roadmap, uh, well, say, conclude that, that uh, the data citation should be represented in a scholarly articles in the following way, either in the reference list um, or uh, in, a, in a section saying where is the data availability um, uh, for, that, uh, for that article, and that is done sometimes just by uh, just having a statement of uh, here's where you can find the data, uh, or in text and mention as accession numbers. The the reason why uh, they had to provide all those different options is because different communities are doing uh, are already using data, well, referencing data in different ways, and they don't want to have to change all the norms of that community. So the accession numbers are using are used quite often for uh, some um, in biomedicine for some um, large uh, data repositories uh, that that contain genomic data, protein data, uh, so that we continue reusing those um, makes sense well, since this is such a, a practice already now. However, the, um, these, uh, publi the publishers in, for the, for the, from this group, from the publisher roadmap, uh, suggested or recommended that the, that the data citation should be the reference list. That, that's their first recommendation. Um, then it is clear that it has the importance of other publications and it's uh, handled similarly to, data, to any other data citation. I mean, uh, any other citation, not only of data, but of other of articles and books. So then the, the other group besides the, the publishers group was the data repositories group, the roadmap for the data repositories. And that's the one that Martin and I uh, have led. Uh, this, um, the picture that you're seeing now is in, uh, in San Diego where we had the kickoff meeting to discuss the metadata standards for data citation and persistent identifiers. Um, and it, well, besides being a wonderful meeting, uh, it, it helped us very much to get the agreement, agreement of what direction we wanted to go for a roadmap uh, for, to implement data citation in data repositories. That was, I believe, uh, the beginning of um, of summer uh, 2016, and since then, uh, well, for the the following six months, Martin and I and a few others that uh, that continue contributing through calls and through the um, online discussions, uh, we put together then the, this data citation uh, roadmap and, and it, uh, it is published and now as a preprint uh, in also in bioarchives together with the roadmap for, uh, for publishers. So, uh, what are the, the main pieces of this roadmap for repositories? Uh, if, you, if you have a data repository, you're supporting or maintaining a data repository, uh, and you want to implement the recitation, you need to think of persistent identifiers, how you're going to support those. You need to think of a landing page for a data set, uh, the documentation and the support that you will provide to, to uh, to uh, describe how the data citation um, is done and how do you how do, uh, others can reuse it, uh, the metadata that is associated with that data citation, and we're putting here schema.org because that's one of the things that we're int we're introducing for better discoverability of data sets, and, and it's part of this data citation ecosystem. If we want um, data citation to uh, well data sets to be uh, easy, easily findable, um, not only well supported in repositories, but in, they need to be uh, uh, discoverable and accessible. We will talk more about Schema.org in the second part. So what it, when um, when we wrote that um, the roadmap uh, that is now published in the preprint, we organized our recommendations in 
three different groups. One, the required, the recommended, and the optional. So we'll start with those required one. Uh, we, we still call it recommendations because those are our suggestions to the community and to all the, and the data repositories and stakeholders say this is what we require, but we are, we are open to uh, feedback and to, um, well, uh, it's a continuous open discussion to, to improve these recommendations that we're making in the preprint. Uh, so the, the required uh, recommendations, if this, long, if this is not an oxymoron, is that uh, all data sets intended for citation must have globally unique persistent identifiers that can be expressed as an unambiguous URL. Uh, you, you will be familiar with, uh, probably with what that means. Uh, you, we, we've seen that for uh, cita uh, citing articles, scholarly articles, right? That if, for example, if you use uh, DOI as a as the global unique persistent identifier, you have a URL for that DOI that uh, that it just it will always resolve to the article in, in in the case of articles. But in this case, we're talking about resolving that when you uh, enter that URL, it would go to the data set page. Uh, the persistent, the second one is that the persistent identifiers for data sets must support multiple levels of granularity where appropriate. So the, this is um, in the case of, um, uh, well, that you might have different versions um, of a data set, uh, or you have, um, uh, you might want to just reference a part of the data set, you, sh you should support then the the persistent identifier, well, the way to be able to reference that uniquely, and that would be through a persistent identifier. Uh, this persistent identifier expressed as URL must resolve to a landing page specific for that data set. So I already mentioned that briefly, but uh, basically it is one of the, the, the important parts of a data citation is that when, when you have that persistent identifier and you're resolving that, uh, it's not directly to the data file, so the, the, the database. It should be to a landing page because a landing page will have information about the data set, how to access it, uh, what terms of use may apply to it, and other information that are relevant to reuse the data set. And you want that to be supporting the data citation. Uh, and then the persistent identifier must be embedded in the landing page in a machine-readable format and the, the repository must provide documentation and support for data citation. So if we go into some of these details, uh, for global unique persistent identifiers, um, well, we first want to see that, that even though uh, we, we would want the data set to be as persistent as as it can be, basically, we won't be able to, to provide, when we provide a reference, to be able to access that data set forever. But the, the one thing that we can, that we want to guarantee, because the data, the data uh, itself might not be accessible over time, but at least the metadata that describes that data set should be pers uh, persistent. And it should be, I mean, at least in terms of data citation, that's what is important, that you can find um, the information about that data set, even if that, for some reason, the data in the future could not be uh, accessible. Uh, then also the, the persistent identifier needs to be machine actionable. Um, the, it has to be globally unique. And in some cases, uh, that is given when you're registering to, for example, to data site and when you get a global unique identify, uh, it's given to you a global unique identifier, but if you have um, a, an ID that it's only for your local database or data repository, you need to make sure that there is a prefix that will make it unique, globally unique. And it has to be widely used by a community, and that's why uh, the, the publishers recognize that and they accept also accession numbers, not the DOIs for some communities. Uh, and I think at this point we're going to turn. Uh, we're, we're switching to Martin, and thank you. We'll take. I'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Martin. So I will continue 
uh, explain a little bit more some of the required recommendations. And the next one that Mercer briefly talked about already is multiple levels of granularity, um, which could be merchants or could be subsets. And of course, there are extreme cases um, with dynamic data citation where this can be, can be really tricky. And that's sort of a webinar in itself. But just to say that uh, for the specificity requirement in the joint data declaration um, principles, it's important that you are able to point to exactly what you are referencing and not not just to a whole data set or to another version or data set, et cetera. And then there's also the other um, case where you have a collection of data sets. And we have an example from one of the organizations involved in our um, working group, which is a collection of images from um, newer imaging, where you might want to reference a specific set of images or you might want to reference the collection. And one, this is cut off here, but one practical example is if the list of source images is pretty long. So if you have, for example, 1,000 DOIs for all the different studies in neuroimaging and you want to cite them in a paper, that it's, sometimes it's easier to just have a DOI for the collection in this case rather than citing all 1,000 uh, because it's sort of becomes unpractical after a certain scale and uh, to put this all in, in a paper unless you put it somewhere else where it's difficult to find. The next requirement was about persistent identifier should resolve to a landing page. And that's something that is a general tool for persistent identifiers, not just uh, for data sets. Um, and that this is a page that gives more information. And from that page, you can go to the data set itself, or you can go to metadata, for example, um, the metadata you need for a citation. That's a common pattern. And for data sets, you shouldn't do anything different. Uh, in some cases, uh, when you use machines, maybe that's you can simplify this. And for that, you can use content negotiation, which is sort of a special case that we can talk about this in discussion if there's interest that you can take a persistent identifier, directly go to the content for sort of machine-enabled workflows or directly go to the metadata that you need for citation. And the persistent identifier should be embedded in that landing page. So this could include both the human readable form for example, in form of how you cite a data set. And that's an example here. Um, uh, or it, or and it should be machine readable. And the simplest way to do this is use a meta tag, um, DC identifier from Dublin Core, uh, so that any machine can fetch this. And the, perf the best example where this is used today and quite for some time now is how reference managers work. So they see this is the identifier, and then they have the workflow depending on what the identifier is. So if they see it's a DUI, they know where to look up the metadata. And um, what we have right now is that this is one of the things that are not quite implemented in a consistent way. You, so you could imagine that you can embed identifiers in a machine readable way in about a dozen different ways, and that makes it very hard if every data repository does this slightly differently. So that's one of the areas where implementing these recommendations, we have to work closely with data repositories and finding something that works for everyone. And the meta tag is really uh, something that many are doing already, or that should be very easy to implement. The documentation support is something that also was highlighted by the publishers. Um, expert group that all of these things need documentation support, both for the authors, um, but more generally for, for everyone involved in this workflow. Because data citation is so hard, partly because it involves a large number of people, organization tools that all have to sort of work together instead of um, just going to one place, doing something, and then, then it's done. 
and something that the project um, is not finished doing is provide examples and documentation um, at, at a dedicated website that was another expert group of this which generated FAQ and other documents and that's one of the resources that we can then point to which would be pretty soon. We now move to the yeah, that's really tricky word. The recommended recommendation that doesn't make any sense, but just take it for now. Um, the next one is metadata required for our citation should be included in the landing page. And that's something that has already generated a bit of discussion. And then we can talk about this also in our discussion, why this is required and not recommended. And the important part here is that the metadata on the landing page. So there are many examples where the metadata are fetched from somewhere else or where the metadata are not needed for the data citation because it's, for example, um, the identifier is linked in the data availability statement. We had a very long discussion about how the machine readable part should happen on the landing page because we want to go beyond principles and say what people can actually do. And we ended up recommending schema.org as a metadata standard and using JSON-LD as the format to embed that. The main reason that we prefer this over HTML meta tags, which have been around for a long time and used uh, in various contexts, is that it's just more flexible uh, to do. So meta tags are not so easy if you have nested content, uh, lists of things, or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So JSON is a really nice format to parse content, to write content, and um, that's why we recommended this, uh, being aware that. Not everybody supports this. For example, the reference managers that were also part of our expert group, namely Zotero and EndNote, they are sort of, they're not there yet. They still rely on HTML meta tags. And something um, that we originally said should be optional, but we realized that this is really important and it's easy, and that's why we should update our recommendations is to provide the metadata required for a citation in BibTech format. The discussion about what metadata are required for citation was surprisingly quick because we agreed on the list of things that we all think are required. And there's nothing spectacular there, um, something that you don't have always for other citation metadata, for example, for journal articles, is, is the version, which is really important for data. A um, little less so for textual content and the type. Type meaning the label that is a data set. And that's something that, that we heard from a number of people. If, for example, a data set appears in a reference list, they want to sort of label this because uh, maybe they treat this differently. There's a separate references for data sets in, in rare cases. Or they just want to highlight this to, to the reader that this is, this is a data set. Um, the implementation, so how are these required metadata supported in some uh, commonly used metadata standards? Uh, you see that this is straightforward. There is really little work to do to sort of change the data side or schema.org standard to support all this. It's, it's all there and can be used and, of course, has been used for a while. This is an example from Dataverse, how these metadata could look on the landing page. And I think you all either have seen those pages or if you are sort of responsible for data repositories, do something very similar. And again, you probably provide more metadata than the required metadata for citation. So here, for example, you see a description, which is, of course, something that's very valuable. But as far as these recommendations for data citation go, the minimal you should do is, is include metadata uh, listed on the, that were listed on the last page. Um, for the machine readable part, um, it's important to remember that these are very generic recommendations. So they cover all kinds of persistent identifiers. And some of them, in particular in life sciences where you have accession numbers, 
there is no standard metadata that you describe um, a protein database entry in the same way as you describe a crystal structure. And there's no central index where you could go with the identifier and fetch the metadata, which is different for other identifiers such as DUIs. So strictly speaking, embedding metadata for DUIs, for example, would not be essential on a landing page. But on the other hand, it just simplifies things if, if everybody is doing the same and the landing page is one place where you put this. And if the metadata already exists elsewhere, it's pretty straightforward to just put them also on the landing page. Um, and there are some added benefits to this, um, which means that, for example, it helps with, with discovery, that sort of um, finding what is available because not everybody knows uh, where the metadata might sit otherwise. And in general, uh, if there's sort of standardized ways where reference managers and publishers and others involved in data citation can find metadata, that's um, helpful. We picked schema.org as the way to express these metadata. And there are many reasons for them, one of them being it's a a way that works, that JSON is a nice format for embedding into web pages. Um, another important reason for this group was that this was uh, part of a larger biomedical project. Um, and in the life sciences, uh, work with schema.org is already happening. And it's sort of, this is a nice tie-in in what people in this domain are doing anyway. Um, and we have the data set has since worked a lot with schema.org, and um, we have built extra services around this. Uh, so it, if you take a DUI, um, we can sort of return the metadata in schema.org format instead of data set XML. And, and as in part of this process, we also learned that schema.org works really well for the kinds of things you want to do here, which is really um, passing metadata around in a, in a simplified way. And here's an example of JSON metadata generated for a data set, again, imaging data set, and uh, using content negotiation um, to fetch that information. That's, again, a topic for, for another webinar. But basically, the idea, if you want the metadata in a machine-readable way, you want to go there directly, and you don't necessarily want to go to a landing page first. And what we can do now is working with data centers and we've start this, started this process where they can do basically the same and fetch the metadata in this format from data site, from the metadata they have provided in another metadata standard. So that not every data center has to implement uh, schema.org, but they can take advantage of what they've done already. Um, I'm getting to the end, to the last Two slides. Uh, something that's important is, of course, once you enable data citation, how can you find these data citations? And that's obviously a very big topic that's out of scope for, for our project. But luckily, there is, um, there is an activity that tries to address that, uh, which is part of the Research Data Alliance, and is a working group called Scholarly Links Exchange, which really is a sort of a follow-up group to an earlier group that discussed more the general architecture. And this group is really about implementation and has a very nice um, uptake by a lot of organizations essential for this with overlap to our group. So there's a lot of publishers, data repositories, infrastructure providers, etc. involved. Um, there are four core chairs. I'm one of them. Paolo Mangi from Open Air is one of them, and then Wouter from Elsewhere, and Adrian from the Australian National Data Service. So I wouldn't be surprised if you have discussed this before uh, as part of the LIBA webinars. Otherwise, we are all happy to provide more information. And uh, of course, this group is always open for participation. Lastly, uh, to move, for move forward. What we want to do is, um, and what we have started doing after publishing preprint is, is, is collecting feedback where people tell us anything from, um, I don't understand this, this part in your document to uh, have you, you have forgotten X or Y. 
Um, we have also started to work with data repositories to either uh, have them tell us, yes, we will implement these recommendations because we think they are important, or we have already implemented some of them. And we did, for example, a webinar with data set members a few months ago and uh, found that many of these recommendations are really sort of common sense, and most data repositories are using, doing this anyway already, including, for example, using persistent identifiers. And when we have enough of all this, enough good feedback, enough uptake, uh, then the plan is to publish an updated recommendations paper so that there's a big difference between um, a paper that says what people could do to actually uh, writing about what people have implemented and what works and what not and who is doing this and where you can find uh, real world examples. And I think um, we are on a good track uh, to, to get there. And I want to finish with thanks to, uh, in particular, the DCIP executive team who was coordinating the overall effort because there were several expert groups, not just the repositories group. Particular Tim Clark to also help with this particular slide deck we're presenting today, and of course to the many people involved in the various expert groups. Uh, the picture you saw with our expert group that was just a, a, a subset of people who could come to this in-person meeting. Uh, thank you very much, and now I miss an eye open for any question you might have. Thank you, Master and Martin, for this excellent presentation. Um, yeah, so I hand over to Rob, who will collect the questions. Yes. Please put some yes, more hello. in the chat. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Merce. Thanks, uh, Martin, for an excellent presentation. This is definitely the most technical webinar we had so far. Uh, please enter your questions into the chat. Um, we will um, see what comes up. Uh, we have prepared a few questions um, for the time in between. Well. Um, both to uh, Mercy and to uh, to Martin, since this is a very technical uh, project, um, uh, what would be sort of the key messages to the uh, non-technical people for this project and the lessons learned? What what would be the three key messages? I'm asking that both to Mercy and to Martin. Mercy, you first. Yeah, I could. I I can start, and Martin, at anything you want. I mean, I, I think the main thing that uh, the, or the, the message that we want to send is that in order to support uh, the goals that we have for supporting data citation, uh, in spite of the detail, the technical details, is to make data more discoverable and more accessible. So, um, and, and uh, of course, the last part is reusable, right? And that would would um, uh, well, data citation itself doesn't support a lot of the how reusable it will be because it will depend on how well what, what is the quality of the data and the metadata. But if you think of that, that's um, the goal that we're we're seeking uh, with these technical implementations is that there will be more systems that will find those data sets and more ways of accessing uh, the the citation information. So those data sets are easy to find across, um, well, and easy to uh, to match to publications, and therefore it will make a bigger impact. Uh, all the data sets that are being published will make a bigger impact on the in the long term. Uh, Martin, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I keep it short. I think. Number one, two, and three is building a community and working together. And, and what, what is both a challenge but also very gratifying is that you, yeah, publishers have to work with data repositories, have to work with technical people, have to work with people that do outreach. Uh, otherwise, this cannot work. And I think that's, for me, that's the key message because the technical stuff is really just yes. a means to an end at the end of Thanks. the day. Um, questions are already coming up. Um, Anya says, "From is there a solution for the citation of dynamic databases? How would you approach that? Uh, I would say the RDA recommendations for dynamic data are pretty good and are sort of fully consistent with what we are doing. So how the persistent identifier, if you, if you do that following their recommendation, then you can 
this feed this into this exactly as any other data. Okay, nothing to add to that. I think, Mercy. I think for all the, the groups that have worked on dynamic data with RDA, they would uh, they talk about timestamps as part of the data citation, and this is part of what we included as a granularity of the of the data, right? And a specificity. I mean, in, within the data citation. Yeah, clear. Um, another person from the audience says, "From do you have uh, recommendations regarding to linking metadata with semantic data sources, such as authors to ORCID or researcher ID, keywords, subjects to some dictionary?" Well, I think um, we focused on linking linking data to articles, that's tricky enough, but of course the general concept is, of course, relevant to linking everything else. And, and ORCID is a good example where we do a lot of work um, integrating with them, but so this is the first step of something more general, and if I can already answer that question about software, that's a perfect example, that's an obvious next one. And there will be a, a, another 411 group called software citation implementation that, that, that's just about to start now, which is in a way sort of repeat of many of the things this group worked on, but with a, of course with addressing specific issues with software, mm -hmm. and you can extend and this let to me add also lots that, of uh, other things. I mean, uh, here the focus has been in the basic things you need for data citation implementation, right? But, um, but when we talk about, for example, the attribution to author, to data authors, so in the data citation, uh, it, it doesn't mean that that it's um, that you just need to give the the name of the author as as part of the meta the author metadata. In fact, in uh, dataverse repository systems, we support, for example, attribu attribu different attributions or attributes to the author field, and that could be an ORCID ID or research ID. So uh, all these metadata can be extended with attributes that will connect to other resources. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thanks for these additions. Um, okay, um, last question asked is that, it's rather technical again, some of the data managers argue that the data sets metadata, ISO 19115 for example, served online through an XSLT can serve as the data landing page. In other words, a formal landing page is unnecessary if the data set metadata includes citation, etc. How effectively does this perspective of landing page address recommendation number three? Oh, yes, well, I'll, I'll try to answer part of this question. and. and so the, you know that also came from the data citation principles, the joint declaration of the data citation principles, the landing page part. Uh, so it, it is, um, it, it has been discussed with a very large group, with a large community and contributions from many different stakeholders. But uh, I, I would argue that, that this metadata might not have all the information that is needed. Um, I mean, to, to have the, the human readable page in addition to the machine actionable uh, metadata, it's important for for just uh, accessibility and user friendliness, and and be able to um, just make sense of what is that you're going to access. And and there are other things about requesting access, for example, to the data that you would need through a landing page, uh, that it would be hard to provide all as only, well, using one of these other options. Mm -hmm. Martin, I don't know if you want to add anything to that? No, I would have said something very similar. Right. How do you um, sort of conceptualize, there was one remark made, I think, in the beginning of this session, the difference between um, Reference, referencing a data set that is used versus referencing a data set that is available. So in terms of developing metrics, how would you, how do you approach this? Um, so, so 
so if the question is about tracking data citation, then one topic that comes up a lot, but I think it's not quite what you're asking, but I sort of <laughs> try it anyway, which is the difference between a data set that is sort of part of a publication. So you have an article and associated data, you publish it together, and you want to sort of find those versus a data set that was created, published, and then somebody else, maybe sometime later, cites that. And that there's a wish by many that to distinguish these two uses, and you can do this by providing a relation type of, of the link between the data set and the article, which for reference list is always the same thing. But um, if you're a publisher in the metadata you send to Crossref, there's also another way you can provide this information. And then you can say this data set was supplementary information to the article or was referenced or et cetera, et cetera. So that provides more granularity than a reference list, which is basically A sites B. But I'm not quite sure I, I fully addressed the question yeah, here. Yeah, what I was heading after. Um, anything to add to that, Merce? Uh, no, no, that's good. That's good. Thanks, uh, Martin. You answered <laughs> what I intended. Uh, if, if I can add something, because it was one of the questions. Um, to be clear, if you put a persistent identifier for a data set into a data validity statement and you send this metadata to Crossref, if you use a Crossref DUI as a publisher, this information can also be forwarded and, and can be tracked. So reference list is not the only way to sort of to do this data citation. It's much easier. But it's basically publisher sends metadata that includes the link to the persistent identifier for the data. That's the basic principle. That sort of different ways that the publishers describe okay. the all address. Um, another question coming in: Do you have was not literally mentioned in this presentation, but it, um, since you're expert in this field, um, what is the experience, for example, with the Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index in terms of the um, is it adapted by by research communities? Um, um, yeah, is, can you comment on that, for example? So as the data citation index is, is the, I think, the, uh, so far the only um, index, data citation index, which has ended up in a formal reference manager. Well, so I, I don't have enough um, sort of detailed experience going sort of looking very careful uh, data citation index, what works and what doesn't. Um, but that's sort of something that um, is a very good question, but I don't just have enough detail of how I, they go about this. I think a general reference list is, is the best place because that's the easiest way. Uh, if, if, if a persistent identifier is not part of the metadata, um, but it's basically the text, then you need access to the full text, which for something that's not open access is tricky, and, and then you get quickly get into territory where it's easy to miss these things. That's why I think it's it's extremely important that data citation is metadata that is sort of treated separately from content and is sent is sort of sent to other infrastructure providers without restriction. And that's sort of one of the things that this scholar link exchange project I briefly mentioned is about okay. uh, to work together on this. question from Murphy. Um, are the, the recommendations already implemented in Dataverse? So, yeah, good uh, and thanks for the question. It's, uh, almost, almost, but uh, the part of this, uh, actually this, uh, this work that we're doing with Martin is to, after having identified all these recommendations to, uh, to un for the data repository systems to endorse them and implement all of them. So I would say for Dataverse, we implement uh, the required ones uh, in terms of a globally unique identifier using the OIs or handles, um, the, the multiple levels of granularity support, right, and the landing page and documentation and support. But uh, but in terms of the machine readable metadata, uh, we're still lacking of some of the support for that, and even more with the JSON LD because these are relatively recent recommendations that we've done for repositories. So our plan is to, as Martin pointed out of next steps, is to um, 
uh, to implement the, well to to commit to implement those in the repositories and we already have it in the roadmap to do that this summer yes yes um, okay I think you already commented on any special observation about audio and video data I think it's already been covered somewhat a very practical one, if an institution does not have a data site membership, how will it be possible to obtain a DOI to data? I'll leave that for Martin. <laughs> Question from the audience. Well, I, I think, um, just to be clear, because, so if the presentation was too DOI-centric, uh, that that's just sort of our background because Dataverse uses handles and DYs and I work for DataSite. Recommendations are really about the principles and you can implement this in various ways. If you decide uh, you want to use a DY, then of course you can become a DataSite member or you can work with one of the existing members, which meets, for example, uh, in places like Germany. Uh, I think this is pretty well covered and there's also not really a cost associated with doing that. Uh, I saw at least, yeah, so there are six data set members in Germany that basically they work with a variety of their repositories, so that should not be a roadblock. In, in other countries, uh, it's similar, but it's sort of, this. it's a little bit different depending on, on where you are and what kind of data you have, what discipline, et cetera, with whom you best work. But this should definitely not be a hurdle that you Just cannot overcome to compared to the some of the other things we say. do not exclude the use of other type of persistent identifiers. I mean, even in data, where uh, the software uh, can be configured to use handles in instead of DOIs. Uh, the, the, the reason why uh, we, well, we suggest the use of DOIs is because they have a, a larger community and uh, more broadly used in the publisher's role so it's, a, it's sort of an easier way to for people to become a, uh, uh, accustomed to um, and to data citation using something that is more widely used. But it, but there is there are other options. Okay. Um, last question. Well, since we're talking to a library community here, data site is working for data. However, a considerable portion of DOIs contain text documents, something all, sometimes also journal articles. Would it be possible to implement periodical volume and issue number as metadata tags? Question mark. Yes, yes, because I... Can I try to add to this person? <laughs> No, because this is a topic that has come up frequently and I'm painfully aware of this. I think there are two reasons why this is not easy right now. One is sort of the, the history of data site built on top of Dublin Core, which also does include these context, uh, concepts, sort of at least not, uh, it's not at center. It's a little tricky to do that in Dublin Core. And number two, that data site where it started was really focusing on um, data sets. But of course, we have about two million DOIs for text documents. And if you want to, if you want to do a proper citation, you need volume issue uh, page number. I would also add that that's a decision for the data site metadata group whether to go with that direction or not. There's no no technical reason. It's really just whether there's enough data set users okay. that need that. Um. I again want to thank both presenters and um, um, everyone contributing to this uh, to this webinar. I will now um, give back to um, to Birgit. Birgit. Yeah. So <laughs> we are done basically. So um, we're all for joining today. And um, yeah. Your sound is not good. My sound is not good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the recording will be made available in a few days. Please spread the word and. Thank you for joining today, and we hope to see you back in the next edition of this webinar series. So thank you again to, to the speakers. And Rob, thank you. It was a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So bye-bye all. Bye-bye all. Thanks, everyone.